Erev Tov Chabrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. President Bashar al-Assad slams a Swiss journalist on their own television interview. Uh, clearly a journalist or a reporter here, TV reporter that definitely seemed to be more inflammatory in his accusations against uh, the president, the Syrian president, by all the false media propaganda that's been coming out of Syria, mainly by Western media and sources, and a lot of also false accusations. We decided to take, though, and look at some of the points during this television interview and share with you the facts that were not at the fingertips of Bashar al-Assad during the interview. Let's take a look at this, starting here at 6.22 minutes in the report here. By the way, if you look in our link below, you will be able to find uh, all the, the links that are involved uh, that we will be sharing with you here so that you can trace this information, the facts that are provided uh, for this particular uh, newscast. Start right here, 6.22. This is where <clears throat> the, uh, the, uh, the reporter here, the Swiss reporter, is going to accuse Syria for bombing hospitals. Listen to this. Look, uh, when they say that we are bombarding the hospital, uh, it means that we are killing uh, civilians. That's the meaning of the word. The question, why would the government kill civilians, whether in hospitals or in streets or schools or anywhere? Uh, you are talking about killing Syrians. Uh, when we kill Syrians as a government or as army, the biggest part of the Syrian society will be against us. You cannot succeed in your war if you are killing uh, civilians. So this story and this narrative is <laughs> mendacious. As he calls it, as the story is vendacious, and in fact it really is. And the thing is, is what many people are not aware of is the propaganda that is behind this to start with uh, about killing these civilians. And I like the way that President Bashar al-Assad does it. It's Syrians, period. It doesn't matter which side of the group they're on. Many times the Assad government has been asking their own people to put down their arms and stop fighting and come back into society. Because why? They know that they have been lured away by the United States-backed uh, rebels, and, and not just the moderate rebels, the U.S. Clearly, the, the information is out there that, that indicts both Hillary Clinton, the Obama regime as well, that have armed and funded ISIS from the very beginning. And now ISIS is totally out of control. Well, maybe not completely out of control, because we've seen a lot of things that have happened ever since the bombing, the breaking of the ceasefire agreement that was broken by the U.S.-led coalition, where they attacked the Syrian army that also included Russian commandos that were fighting there near Del El Zor in eastern Syria. This is where everything really began to fall apart, is during this, uh, this breaking of the ceasefire when John Kerry himself claims that they were trying to get a ceasefire from the very beginning that would last a week and not three days. Well, the one that it violated it was the U.S.-led coalition coming from Iraq with F-16s and A-10s that came in and bombed and killed 62 uh, Syrian soldiers as well as about a dozen Russian commandos and Iraq, uh, Iranian forces that were on the ground there. And now, of course, Mosul, another big joke, as uh, the uh, presidential nominee Donald Trump has said, you've been announcing it for a month for all of ISIS to be able to have plenty of time to get out and go to Syria and get ready for another war there. So, interesting the way that things are actually transpiring. But let's take a look at the hospital situation that they're talking about. Uh, we're going to give you some actual articles in just a moment, but right here on Moon of Alabama uh, is a very good uh, source here. Uh, moon, uh, moonofalabama.org is their website there. They actually show you several hospitals that keep getting destroyed over and over and over again. And this is why you know it's propaganda. Remember, especially in the case of Aleppo, where most of these hospitals are at, that are being destroyed. These hospitals are under a constant bombardment of not just aerial attacks, but definitely from the different radical groups that are supported by the U.S. and NATO coalition there that, are, that have been shelling and bombing civilians here for, for months on end in this region here. And of course, the Syrian government is trying to take it back. Now, President Assad clearly in the interview there does state that yes, there are civilians that are killed when there are aerial bombardments. It's not intentional, just like the U.S. always says. And the U.S. has been saying it quite a bit here recently, even in the case of the attack of Mosul. Who are they really attacking if they've warned ISIS to already leave and left the corridor open for them? 
civilians, no doubt. Well, that'll be the case of it, just like that was in Yemen when the Saudis, who also are part of the Syrian conflict and funding and, and, and giving all kinds of arms and uh, things to be able to attack the Syrian people to overthrow Bashar al-Assad as well as Turkey. President Erdogan very guilty in this battle as well. But all these guys here, they're funding these terrorists that are in this area here only to do what? To topple one man, Bashar al-Assad, because you don't like what? The way he governs the country? Maybe it's part of a bigger picture that we're missing here. But anyway, looking at what it says here, Jets bombed Children's Hospital in Re rebel-held Aleppo, June 10th of 2016. All right, now it also says, last hospital in Aleppo destroyed week after week after week, as it states here in the article here. So the hospital was destroyed that was bombed on June 10th of 2016, but then in July 31st, well, almost two months later, exclusive, four babies killed in an attack on Aleppo's last children's hospital. Jets, remember, June 10th, Jets bombed last children's hospital and, and rebel held Aleppo. What do they keep doing? They keep destroying the same hospitals over and over and over. All right, first responder, and then charitable hospital. Last major North Aleppo hospital destroyed by Rush, excuse me, Russian airstrike February 3rd of 2016. Once they figure you're not watching the news and paying attention that much more, July, about five months later, they come right back out again. A Nodden hospital just hit by airstrike Northern Aleppo. It's kind of funny, they keep saying that these all these hospitals are hit by airstrikes. Perhaps they're being shelled by the rebels, the moderate, Al-Nursa, Al-Qaeda, all the different ones that are operating in this area and recently pledged that they're working together. Now before I show you another hospital, let me take you over to John Kerry and what John Kerry has to say when they talk about all this evidence that's going on that these hospitals are being bombed. Let's go to the 11, uh, 11 30 second mark right here. All right, we're going to take a look at this right here and see what is said by Secretary of State John Kerry about uh, evidence. Because they keep saying it's happening, but where's the evidence? In our own teams, the Syrian civil defense teams, we've documented since the start of the Russian uh, intervention in Syria, from day one until February of this uh, year, more than 17 of our Syrian civil defense personnel have been killed by Russian strikes. Do you have any videos of the airplanes that have been striking? I've been from videos and have you been about these by us? I don't know. Can we get I mean, I don't know. Do you have any video? They're, they're going to answer it. They're first, he's, he's speaking in Arabic and they're going to translate for what, what happens here. So can I just say, we get a lot of videos of the victims of these attacks that are terrible, but they don't help us. We need videos of the actual aircraft and the munitions, and there's a lot of them on the internet, and we don't know whether they're real or not. So verified videos of the actual aircraft. Verified videos of the aircraft would actually be helpful, but the funny thing is they don't have it. Now, she does mention that from the start of the, the, the war, 17 of the civil defense team have been killed. That happens to be the White Helmets, and we're going to be addressing who they really are in just a moment. They're not good guys as the way it's been portrayed. They tried to make them look like good guys by making sure they got the Nobel Peace Prize as an organization. But you're going to find out they're actually, many of them are war operatives, and there's been a lot of evidence that also backs that up. Now, let's go back into the Syrian hospitals once again. Another interesting, this is the one that I was following myself, uh, actually this story right here. It says, Syria report, the bombing of Aleppo's Al-Quds Hospital. Huh, that's interesting. October the 2nd at 1503 was the time, 2016, the Russian regime airstrike, which have damaged hospitals in Aleppo in the past week are only the latest attacks in a campaign devastated by the health care in Syria's opposition areas. You know, I sent... Right after this report came out, I sent a text message to Vanessa Bealey, who is a journalist that has been in Aleppo all through Syria covering the war, only to find out that everything that we've been hearing in mainstream media is nothing but a bunch of propaganda. And that, in fact, President Bashar al-Assad 
is only a victim of war crimes of the West. And you're going to see more of that in just a moment. And I asked her, what is it then about the, the, uh, about the Russians shelling the al Quds Hospital? She said, Steve, seriously, I can give you a hundred articles right now of this hospital's been destroyed how many times already? All I had to do then was take a look for myself, and sure enough, on April the 28th of 2016, Syria airstrikes destroy Aleppo's Al Quds Hospital, killing 14. Yet again. And I knew this is the reason why I asked Vanessa about this in a text message to her, because I already knew that other hospitals had been being destroyed over and over and over. But I didn't know about Al Quds. But she clearly pointed me in the right direction. I found the information for myself, only to realize that, yes, they keep destroying the same hospitals over and over and over. So how much propaganda does American media end up buying before we really realize what the truth all is? Let's take a look a little bit more in the interview here. Going on to about the eight-minute mark here, and uh, this is where uh, uh, you will find that uh, we still have the Syrian president, Bashar al-Assad, he's still talking about uh, protecting the civilians uh, from, and also talking about how that the aerial campaigns do cause uh, you know, collateral damage. He doesn't use the word like America does, but they try to limit it. And he talks about how that they don't want the death of their own people. And it's funny, there's so many people in support of this man as the president, still, even with a five-year civil war, and you would think it's the other way around, but they don't. They still support their own president. Something tells you something is majorly wrong. All right, so let's listen to this. And then right at the end of his statement here, this is when the very reporter interviewing, the Swiss reporter here, is going to ask him, why doesn't he stop at all? I want to challenge that statement. Well, but again, uh, the terrorists. But that doesn't mean that every uh, bomb that fell somewhere was by airplane or by the Syrian army. If you are talking about specific uh, incident, let's say, we have to verify that specific incident, but I'm answering you in general now. But you have the power to change the situation also for the children in Aleppo. Of course, that, uh, that's why... Will you do that? Exactly, that's our mission according to the Constitution, according to the law, that we have to protect the people, that we have to get rid As he says there, you had the power to stop it, to change that. This is what the Swiss reporter actually says, very much putting the entire burden upon his shoulders. Now, he's also speaking, and I actually, I got to hear the whole report, so I, I, I'm not playing every single word that's this, this brought out in this, but he says, stays there beforehand. When he says, I'm speaking in general, he's trying to show you that yes, the airstrikes may cause civilian deaths, but what you're not looking at, what the West is not reporting to the world, is that the uh, the, uh, the Al-Qaeda, the Al-Nursa, the moderate rebels, etc., they are intentionally in Aleppo targeting the civilian populations. It's just like the case that I had in Ukraine where that one journalist goes out and talks about all the deaths of the Ukrainian citizens that are happening, but he fails to mention to you that all those deaths that were happening of the civilians are the eastern Ukraine. It is the uh, the Donetsk People's Republic, people that are dying in the combat, had nothing to do with the civilians of the uh, Kiev government, of Petro Poroshenko. All right? That's what we're seeing in this case as well. Now, I do, no doubt, I believe that there are civilians that are killed. We know that the opposition there is not allowing the civilians to leave and to go to uh, western Aleppo where the government forces are. They're holding them as human shields. They want casualties. It's what we have seen over and over and over in other conflicts around the region. Uh, and this is what's happening. This is what NATO wants. They want a large mass amount of people dead in order to be able to justify their ground operation that they're hoping to get started in the very near future. Uh, and so there, there he takes and he blames all of this on President Assad and says, you're the man that can bring an end to it. Well, I would have to challenge this to the Swiss reporter. President Barack Obama could bring an end to it. Hillary Clinton could bring an end to it. No doubt Donald Trump would bring an end to it. But also Angela Merkel, Frank Holland as well could bring an end to what is going on. But they can't bring an end unless Obama brings an end to it because Obama has got all the oligarchs of the world making sure, maybe not oligarchs, but Illuminati, all the Illuminati there are the ones that are telling him what to do. And their point is, is overthrow this guy right here. 
that's what they want to do is overthrow President Bashar al-Assad. So had they stopped funding these terrorists, and let me include the Saudi princes funding the terrorists, President Erdogan funding the terrorists, all of these terrorists that are being funded in this country and shipping in the mercenaries from Afghanistan and Uzbekistan and places like this, this could have long been ended already had somebody stopped on the other end. But no, when Russia came in, they didn't stop. They only upped the ante. And this is something else that also you will hear in just a few moments here that John Kerry says. We keep dumping more and more weapons in, as he states in this uh, secret uh, released uh, audio recording of him in New York. But he said it's only going to cause more casualties to the civilians. All right, now let's press on. Uh, we will, let's see, we're going to go to minute 822. That's where we just list. You have the power to change it. Let's go to, to the nine minute mark here. This is where I think that President Bashar al Assad is caught off guard. And this is going to be the explosive one. So many people around the world exposed to propaganda believing that this is really true. Watch what happens here. May I show you a picture? This young boy has become the symbol of the war. Mm. And you know this picture? Of course I saw it. His name is Omran, five years old, yeah. covered with blood, scared, traumatized. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you would like to say to Omran and his family? Oh, there's something I would like to say to you, first of all, because I want you to go back after my interview and go to the internet to see the same picture of the same child with his sister. Both were rescued by what they call them in the West, white helmets, which is a facelift of al-Nusra in Aleppo. Mm -hmm. They were rescued twice, each one in different incident, and uh, just as part of the publicity of those white, helmet, white helmets. None of these incidents were true. You can have it manipulated, and it is manipulated. I'm going to send you those two pictures, and they are on the internet. Just to, know, just to see that this is a forged picture, not a real one. We have real pictures of children being harmed, but this one in specific is a forged one. I appreciate. Yes, it is true that innocent children are dying, and he's right about that. And the problem is, is stop funding the terrorists, and that would end. All right? Now, he mentions on the Internet, but... It's not just a matter of on the internet. It is credible journalists there that have exposed this. It is investigative journalism work that is exposing exactly what President Bashar al-Assad is talking about. This here is called Activist Post. All right, it is uh, the footage of the boy in Aleppo as an opportunist vile propaganda from Western media. Now he does mention, and I didn't take the time to get that ready here, that this boy has been rescued more than once and his sister more than once. There are many, many cases like that. Look up Vanessa Bealey, just type in her name on the internet. You'll find it. She's an incredible journalist doing it. She's not the only one. There's many journalists that have been able to prove these things over and over and over. This boy here, as many have pointed out in the photo right here, is that he, here he is, an injured boy, brought into the ambulance, put into this ambulance, and nobody is attending him. If the guy was just pulled out of the rubble and is all mangled up and everything from that, you know, everybody just thinks, well, he's in shock, all right? This is what a lot of people are just assuming. He's in shock, okay? Let's take a look a little bit at the video itself. <laughs> Answer me one question. This is something that when I first saw it, I, I have to admit to you, my heart was moved by it. Because I saw this, and all I could think is, oh my God, when will this carnage ever stop? But then those that had already seen this young man in a photo before being rescued by the White Helmets, they begin to point out things that most of us don't look at because our mind is first focused on a child that appears to be injured. But then they begin to point out the obvious. Why is it that everybody is only there for a photo op of this boy? 
Why is it though his head seemingly bashed in, he's not crying? You know, and it's not like he's bashed in, it's just he's cut or whatever, and they got supposedly blood on him, etc. But he's not reacting. You know, as a little kid his age there, I was in the hospital so many times from busted head, from stupid stuff, falling off a bicycle back in the days when asphalt was not nice and smooth, big giant, jagged rocks and stuff, and having seven stitches put in my forehead and the back of my head, running into a yucca plant face on as a little kid. Believe me, I was not just in shock, I was screaming and hollering of it, and I lost a lot of blood, had my entire front of my shirt covered in blood. But this little boy, even as he goes on there, one of the things, if you notice right here in the video, watch, he takes, he reaches up to wipe away the stuff on his face there. In another video footage, it shows it. He has no room, doesn't bother him that he's hurt or nothing. He just goes to wipe away a little bit because I guess it's getting itchy from maybe the makeup that they're using on him. All right, and this is the white helmets. The white helmets always have great photo op opportunities. But look it up. Look at the article. Go to the link. Read what they're talking about in here. Nice brand new ambulance, everything. There's many, many different experts that have looked at this and know from this young man he's being rescued more than one time. All right, now, um, as well, let's see here. The other issue here, and let's see which one we're going to get into on this here real quick. Uh, the, the white helmets is another big issue in here. And that's what uh, President Bashar al-Assad talks about. And this is, uh, RT has actually carried the story from Vanessa Bealey. Vanessa is not a Russian. She's not a Syrian. You know, I, I'm assuming Vanessa is from the UK from the sound of her accent, but I've never actually asked Vanessa before where she's from. On October the 7th, massive evidence, foreign fun, white helmets support terrorists. Okay, massive evidence. You know, I mean, everything from this entire war has been one thing after another, sh clearly showing all the people that are involved, and the world still turns their back to it. Even when, when RT's uh, journalists found the documents showing that they were selling Assad's oil uh, through Turkey, and Assad does say in this interview that he knows that Erdogan's son was the one that was buying all the oil up and taking it and shipping it out of his country, stealing his oil and stuff. Everything being done illegally, and nobody pays attention, but yet the evidence has been overwhelming. All right, now, quickly, RT asked uh, Vanessa, the White Helmets claim to be a neutral, impartial humanitarian NGO. Is that really the case? She says, it's impossible for that to be legitimate. Let's take it, first of all, neutral. They claim that they receive no funding from any governments that have vested interest in the Syrian conflict, and yet they are, in fact, multi-million funded. The UK, the US, she goes into talking about. Boris Johnson announces another $32 million for this group. Uh, and yet there's so much overwhelming evidence and I have looked at this case after case, but to save time, I can't do it in here. Uh, I'll, maybe I'll include another link on that as well, to where even the people part of the White Helmets, these guys are actually involved, involved in terrorist attacks, etc. Let me see if I actually put one of those up here real quick here. Um, I don't think I did. I was hoping I did, but I, I don't think I did. All right, I apologize. Uh, you know, there, there are over and over and over they have been involved. If you look at Vanessa Billy's reporting there, we've seen, and I've watched the video, I've shared it here on Israeli News Live already here in the, in the recent past, here in the last few weeks here. You can see different uh, uh, footages there where white helmets are beating uh, the Syrians that they have captured uh, by al-Nursa. They have been involved in the beheading uh, uh, of children. In fact, um, let's see, I think I may have... Um, Uh, this one here is not by the White Helmets. I'll, I'll, all right, I'll have to skip that for right now there. But, uh, but the White Helmets clearly have been involved in a lot of ungodly things, the murdering of people. And they say, oh, we got rid of him, etc. There is a lot of information that clearly indicts them for what they do. Uh, but anyway, uh, Vanessa, uh, in, the, in this article here, she says, if we take the leaders, they were both prominent anti-government protesters or demonstrators. Raid Sali was a, actually deported from the U.S. in April of 2016 from Dooley's airport. And Mark uh, Toner avoided the question as to how and why he was deported. While the U.S. is giving $23 million to this organization, he eventually said because of extremist connections. In September this year, we know that Raid Sali was allowed 
back to New York and in the UN and met with Secretary of State John Kerry. But this is not the first time the United States has allowed this terrorist faction leaders in Labib and Al Naz was allowed in December 2015, the leader of Ahra al-Sham. Al it is no stranger to U.S. territory that leaders of terrorist groups or sus suspects groups are allowed into the U.S. The trainer of the White Helmets, and this is very important. It is an ex-British military mercenary, James uh, Lou Mousseau, who was given the OBE in June of 2016 by the British government. If we look at a career and we look at his connections, he's connected back to organizations, private security forums like Blackwater, now called the Academy, who if we remember were basically the CIA outreach of assassination organizations that had millions pumped into them by President Bush and even President Obama, who gave them over 250 million to continue in their role as assassination experts for the CIA. So we're dealing People that are part of the White Helmets are terrorists, mercenaries, see, RTS. The White Helmets are also referred to uh, as the Syrian Civil Defense Team. Is, 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 is it the same thing? It is a complete criminal and illegal taking of a copyright. The real Syrian civil defense inside Syria has existed for 63 years. The White Helmets have existed for three years. They were founded in 2013, and we, we are seeing that there is an erad eradication, eradication of Syrian state institutions and implementation of the Syrian shadow state by predominantly the UK and US, but also supported by the EU governments. Overwhelming, overwhelming the evidence about the White Helmets. All right, again, for the sake of time, and I'll play, place in the links here below where we've covered this before. Let's continue on, though, in this interview right here. Uh, this is going to come. Um, he speaks about Russia is siding with you. Let's go to the 14-minute mark here and catch this right here as well. supply to get into different areas in Aleppo and at the same time to allow the civilians who wanted to leave the terrorist held areas to move to the uh, government controlled uh, area. Is this really a step, an important step? Of course it is an important step at the beginning but uh, it's not enough. Uh, it's about the continuation. How can you allow those civilians to leave? The majority of them wanted to leave uh, the area held by the terrorists but they won't allow them, the others shoot, the, shoot them, or they kill their families if they leave that area. Russia is on your side. What does it mean for you? No, it's not on my side. It's on the international law side. Uh, it's on the other side. For one, what I do like is President Assad clearly shows that the Syrian people are wanting to leave and get away from these rebels and these uh, al-Nursa and al-Qaeda. And uh, the journalist or the reporter here that's uh, doing, this, doing this interview with President Bashar al-Assad uh, really kind of roughs up uh, his feathers there when he says, you believe this is an important step? Uh, any type of ceasefire in order to try to rescue people of any type of humanitarian aid, yes, it is important. And as he said, it is not enough. But they have actually lengthened it on several occasions here, only to once again, like the last ceasefire, to be broken by the U.S.-backed coalition, as it's been reported and proven today that the Belgian uh, F-16s were bombing in northern Aleppo. Again, Russia calling for a ceasefire. The world doesn't want to get involved, doesn't want to be supportive of any ceasefire. So they take the opportunity, while Russia's not in the air, to come and bomb more civilians in northern Aleppo. I guess they were hoping for another military military target, but it didn't happen undoubtedly this time. All right. Now, let's, let's, we're going to conclude in this broadcast here about the chemical weapons, and we have an overwhelming amount of evidence for that. All right. Now, let's go to the 15, 27 minute mark of the, of the interview here, and this is where we'll pick this up right here, and then uh, we're going to look at a lot of evidence on the chemical weapons. Mr. President, you use chemical weapons and barrel bombs in Syria against your own population. These are UN reports. You can't ignore it. You are talking about two different issues. The chemical issue uh, it was proven to be false. and They haven't a uh, shred of evidence about the Syrian army using chemical weapons, uh, particularly before we give up our uh, arsenal. 
in 2013. Now we don't have it anyway. Uh, before that, uh, it was uh, fiction, because if you want to use such a mass destruction armament, uh, you're going to kill thousands of people on one incident, and we didn't have such an incident. Uh, besides that, we wouldn't use it, because you're going to kill your own people, and that's against your uh, interests. So this is uh, false allegation. We don't have to waste all I think it was a very good point, but if you'll notice, though, the reporter accuses him as an indisputable fact that he gassed his own people. All right. Now, I'm going to take, and we're going to really take and break this part of the interview down in tremendously good detail. I want to first go to John Kerry, a leaked interview there, and I want you to see what he says at the 32-minute mark here. Um, mark instead. Cities that we go in, city for city, and fight against people who have IEDs, people who have sniper rifles. You know, it's complicated. And people now who may have gas and other things. So it is not easy. I'm just telling you, it's not easy. You know, there are lots of places in the world where people want to hold our coat while we go fight. But it's not easy. And we're trying to empower Syrians to be able to fight against this guy. Now, now the Russians have changed the equation. Two things here I wanted you to notice, and one that I wanted you to notice is that uh, John Kerry actually states that they may have gas. He doesn't even know if they actually have it or not, but according to what we're being told, that they gas their own people with sarin gas. And as well, he states that the Russians have changed the equation, and he states it twice. They were not anticipating Russia to step in the way they did. Now, let's take a look then. He says they may have gas, all right? So let's take a look at several things that, that, are, that are about this when it comes to the gas. Uh, one right here is a report here that I wanted to share with you. Uh, this is, and we have to get way down here to get into it, Journey to Aleppo Exposing the Truth Buried Under NATO Propaganda. All right, and this is written by Vanessa Bealey. And I want to run down here to the part about chemicals, chemical weapons. The use of chemical weapons against civilians in Western Aleppo by terrorist groups, particularly the Nurse of Front, is an anathema to Western media. Instead, the media picks up spurless reports issued by activist groups and citizens journalists, which claim to be working inside of Aleppo, as the case of the September the 7th report from Al Jazeera in the Syrian Arab Army launching chemical attacks on civilians. This information is dis disseminated with alarming alerting by journalists based in Washington, London, or elsewhere who have limited ability to verify this information or assess this, what's really happening on the ground prior to the publishing of the fact that Nursa Front took over the only chemical factory in Aleppo in 2012. And here's your article about it. Uh, sorry, that's not the article. I actually had to click on it. Uh, this is that article right here. In 2012, Syrian jihadist Al Nursa Front sees his chemical factory near Aleppo. So the one controlling all the chemicals, by the way, is Al Nursa. It's not the Syrian government. So even if they can produce it, and I know that there has been uh, other uh, people on YouTube that are saying that the Syrian government still has the ability to produce chemical weapons. Well, let me tell you what the truth of it is. And that may be coming from Israeli intelligence. The truth of it is, it is Al-Nursa and Al-Qaeda and these groups here and even the moderate rebels that are controlling the actual chemical factories inside of Syria. So it is not Bashar al-Assad making chemical weapons. So if chemical weapons are used again in Syria, it is going to be by these terrorists that the U.S. is backing. Now, let's take a look at all the information that's overwhelmingly against these organizations there inside of there. That we have right here, Seymour Hirsch. Seymour Hirsch right here, uh, it states in here, this is an article from uh, March 28th of 2016. Seymour Hersh says, Hillary approved sending Libya's sarin to Syrian rebels. The Syrian sarin gas, according to this investigative journalist, goes according to 
Hillary Rodham Clinton is approved by her to go to the Syrian rebels to be able to do what? Use it on the people there. Let's take a look at this so you understand what's really happening about this. Seymour Hersh says, Hillary approved sending Libya sarin gas to the Syrian rebels. The great investigative journalist Seymour Hersh in two previous articles in the London Review of Books, who's sarin? the red line and the rat line, has reported that the Obama administration falsely blamed the government of Syria's Bashar al-Assad for the Syrian gas attack uh, that Obama was trying to use as an excuse to invade Syria. Hirsch pointed to a report from British intelligence saying that sarin was used didn't come from the Assad stockpile. Hirsch also said that secret agreement in 2012 was reached between Obama administration and the leaders of Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar to set up a sarin gas attack and blame it on Assad. On that, the U.S. could invade and overthrow Assad. Wow, well, 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 what do you know? Do we have any evidence for this, though? Some people might say, well, that's just a journalist. A journalist says and we don't have any evidence. Yes, you do. Yeah. Not, not only that, the, wet, the evidence has been overwhelming by many people, even like what we have pictured on the screen and behind it here, uh, the former uh, General Wesley Clark, who was over the European command of NATO of 19, from 1997 to the year 2000, when he actually stated publicly he was there at the Pentagon and saw Secretary Rumsfeld and Deputy Secretary of Wolfowitz and he goes downstairs and he speaks about his meeting there of one of the generals that he knew that worked with him before. He says, uh, the general asked him into his office and he called me in and he says, uh, sir, you, you've got to come in and talk with me a sec. And he says, we've made a decision. We're going to war with Iraq. And of course, General Wesley Clark asked, you know, well, did they find out that there was a link between them and Al Qaeda? No, the case, there is no link. He said, you know, basically he just says, you know, we... We have a great military. We've got a bunch of terrorists out here, and, and you know, if 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 uh, everything, if every, if all you got is a good hammer and everything, you know, everything that must be that must be out there must look like a nail in order for us to attack it. But then he goes on to say a few weeks later when he returns. Let me read to you what he actually states here. He said, "I came back to see him a few weeks later, the same general there at the Pentagon." And by that time, we were bombing in Afghanistan. He said, I, are we still going to war with Iraq? Of course, this is after 9-11. This hap originally happened around September 20th, is what General Wesley said he believed uh, the time frame was. Uh, and so he says, uh, so he says uh, are we still going to war with Iraq? And, and the general says, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk. He picked up a piece of paper and said, I just got this down from upstairs meaning the Secretary of Defense's office. He said, I just got this from downstairs today. And he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq, then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off with Iran. So here, General Wesley Clark is showing that the United States has already pre-planned destroying all these nations, including Bashar al-Assad's country. For what? For what? You know, and they stated in here in the article here, the truth is about the Middle East, had there been no oil, there, there would be, it'd be like Africa. Nobody would really care, but they're discovering oil in Africa, so now they're starting to care about Africa as well. So let me share with you another one here, and this is from uh, U.S. Senator Richard Black, and he states here, I have studied the Syrian war, the origins of the war for years, but when you go there and you shake hands with the soldiers and meet the refugees, it turns, and, it turns black and white into technicolor. Syria is one of the most incredible, wonderful nations on earth. And the fact that American set of 10, excuse me, in fact, that, the, that America set out to topple the government and destroy it long before there was the faintest hint of a civil unrest, it's really one of the greatest stains on the American honor. One thing that stands out so vividly is the incredible religious tapestry of the religious harmony between Christians and the Awatis, the Sunnis, the Shiites, everyone. There is such freedom of religion in Syria, and it's stunning. But he says, why is there war in Syria? We know this was not a popular uprising. This was a calculated decision by the CIA, the MI6, French intelligence, working with the Muslim Brotherhood, Turks, the Saudis, an organized plan to topple the government. And, of course, we were a familiar, 
that there are competing plans for oil and gas pipelines. It is true that the oil and gas pipelines are a major, major incentive for this war. You know, guys, when they first, when they first began to try to do a ceasefire, uh, back when uh, John Kerry was calling for meetings in Geneva, we happened to be there to cover that meeting. But the funny thing was, we ended up in the hotel with the U.S.-backed delegation. This is only one photo there, but we have the photos of the U.S. that were meeting with their Syrian, supposedly moderate rebels. Very disturbing, to say the very least. One other thing I want to share with you, though, that I think is important in all of this. And this was uh, the, several, a huge delegation of peace activists went to Syria to find out for themselves to see if it really was so. Henry uh, Lowendorf was one of those activists there that went there to see if Assad was really such a bad guy. They met with the opposition as well as Assad himself. And they gathered their information from both sides. I would like for you to hear just a little bit about what he had to say in this. Listen to this. Is so true. We are fighting a mass of propaganda that has demonized the Syrian government, demonized its leaders, a, an effort that precedes every other intervention that the United States has made over the course of many, many decades in order to convince people that it's okay for quote-unquote, humanitarian reasons to overthrow a government and to replace it with whatever. The United States prefers uh, a government that is not independent, that is a willing uh, participant in what the U.S., whatever U.S. policy is. By this so what we saw in, in Damascus and what we saw in the two villages we visited outside Damascus belies the propaganda that has um, overwhelmed us. It's hard, it, it, it's hard for even those of us who have been in the peace movement Amazing. for a long time. Absolutely. It's hard for us. Amazing. You don't have any evidence. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And what you're about to see is going to be the most powerful evidence you will ever probably see in your life. And it's by this man right here, Aaron Erdem, who is a member of parliament. He is now in prison because Erdogan made sure he ended up in prison because of his strong statements that were used against the uh, President Erdogan of Turkey and also his prime minister as he was stating before parliament and had all the evidence they clearly indicted Turkey for smuggling the sarin gas into Syria, and he was trying to expose it. He had the documents, the evidence, the court reports, etc. He's an attorney working, an MP member of the Turkish government. Watch what he says here. When entrusted, our prime minister says that we sent trucks to the Turkmen's. Let me turn down the volume so we don't have it too loud. Escorted by the National Intelligence League and organization. He says we sent the trucks to Bayer Baak, Turkmen's. And the Deputy Prime Minister says that those trucks were not sent to the Turkmen's. Now one of those statements is a lie. So my question is, is who is the hypocrite? Now, he's going he's to cause an uproar in the parliament for calling them a hypocrite. He's saying that it's, it's going to be either Erdogan, it's going to be the Turkmen, or it's going to be the prime minister. He's calling them a hypocrite, and they get angry at him for this. There is hypocrisy here. According to the meaning of the Hadith, which is from the Quran, Mr. Erdogan, please could you avoid using such rude words in your speech. I am sharing a hadith. You must demonstrate tolerance. The, atro the atrocious we have in front of the atroc the atrociousness which we have in front of us is about this matter, and they're yelling at him in there because he dare challenges the government. Is that they they tell us that the MIT trucks 
Distinguished members of the parliament, one minute, Mr. Erdem, one minute, please look. All right, I wanted to show you how he did something that was very much against him, but he's talking about the sarin gas. Let's take a look at what he says about that sarin gas there. Let's move then on forward, and I believe it's uh, 12 minute mark is where it's at. Oh, sorry, I'm looking at the, the, long, the wrong video footage on this right here. Let me find Aaron's. Here it is, three minute mark. He says, as you all know, many children were murdered with sarin gas in the Middle East. Murdered. There were various accusations about who uses sarin gas in our media. My question is about the Adnan's chief public prosecutors. Investigation case number 2013 uh, forward slash 351 and number 2013 forward slash 139 and indictment 2012 forward slash 120. Don't worry, the prosecutor is not from the parallel organization. The prosecutor in charge desires an action. Pardon me. Don't want to miss what he says. An action in the region. It is stated by the prosecutor in this case that raw materials from the manufacturing sarin gas were delivered to the ISIS terrorist organization through contacts to this group's members. So the prosecutor initiated an investigation about this. This is through Turkey, guys. ISIS got the sarin gas and it came from Turkey and this is a this is a meeting at the parliament in Turkey by Aaron Erdem before it ever came on the news before it ever became public watch what happens here please look at this I am showing you sorry I'm showing this to you the prosecutor made arrest under that investigation now remember, the investigation is for smuggling sarin gas through Turkey by ISIS into Syria. So the individuals who were suspected to have carried out the transportation were arrested and put in prison. The prosecutor ordered the telephones of those suspects. to be wiretapped, which is also stated in the indictment. Mr. Minister of Justice Bozdag is also well aware of the details of this indictment because he himself went on air and made statements. But do you know what happened? In one week's time, that case was closed. The suspects were released and were allowed to leave Turkey by crossing over the Syrian border. Now I ask you, is this what you understand as justice? To set free people transporting sarin gas? I am asking, one journalist states that this is much worse than all I have said before. Do you know who says that the Republic of Turkey has dispatched ammunition of the Al-Qaeda terrorist organizations by orders of Prime Minister serving at the time? Let me tell you, Governor Adnan Hussein Avni, here are the records made by the governor are here. If any of you would like to have them, you can photocopy them. The governor states that he instructed the trucks to go there under the prime minister's orders. Tell me Turkey's not involved. Tell me they're not involved. Why do you think Erdogan is arresting everybody?
Why do you think they did the coup over in Turkey to make it look like everybody was against Erdogan and the U.S. was backing it? It was never the U.S. all along. Erdogan has never left his backing of the United States nor Obama. They did it to kind of do a, a glancing blow at President Putin in order to be able to get their tanks inside of Syria waiting for the U.S. to give the go-ahead to launch a ground invasion. All along, this is what's been happening. And unfortunately, Putin didn't catch it. All right, now, I'm going to let you hear Aaron say these things in English now when he comes out on RT. He is arrested later. All the journalists that exposed Turkey allowing sarin gas into there were all arrested. Why? They didn't want the world. They don't want the West to know about these things. They snuck that video on, on YouTube as well. I'm sure they're not happy if they know it's there yet. Let's take a listen here what Aaron actually says here on RT and what his translator says. Chemical weapon materials were brought to Turkey and put together at ISIL camps in Syria, which was known as the Iraqi Al-Qaeda at the time. We have recordings to confirm this. A public prosecutor opened an investigation which led to those involved being detained. A week after, another public prosecutor was assigned and all the detainees were released. They left Turkey, crossing the Syrian border. The phone recordings in the indictment showed all the details of how the shipment was going to be made, from how it was prepared, to the content of the labs and the source of the materials, which drugs were going to be used, all dates, etc. From A to Z, everything was discussed and recorded. Despite all of this evidence, the suspects were released. The incident that Aaron Erdem recounted took place in 2000. You see, most people would think RT, oh, it's just more propaganda. But you got to hear and see for yourself when he was inside the parliament of Turkey trying to stop further actions of the Turkish government being involved in the Syrian war. But it didn't help. They arrested him, which he was afraid they may do. And as they have arrested so many others. So it's continually over and over and over. All these false claims. Everything that is happening that we are seeing over there. Now, as I kind of close out on this broadcast, I want to show you who the United States backs and who the Syrian government backs. The United States, this is part, this is from Mail Online, and these are the good guys. A sickening video shows U.S.-backed Syrian rebels taunting and then brutally beheading a young boy because he was a spy. The boy was under 12 years old. Okay? I'm not going to show you. You'll, they cover up the image here. They, they beheaded this little boy. This is what the Obama administration is backing. These are the thugs that he backs. And how many more have you seen of this? Not just children they're beheading and killing. I showed you recently on Israeli News Live where they shot the boy in the back of the head. All right? This is where they're torturing him before they kill him. Little bitty guy. Little bitty boy. All right? He's under the age of 12. He's being killed in the back of the pickup truck. They kind of block out the hand with the knife there hide that, but they're going to cut his head off right there in the truck. Accused of being a spy. Who knows if he really was or not. All right. Now this is an example of the people fighting for the Syrian government. Like women around the world, she enjoys putting on makeup before heading to the office. But Miriam's job is a little different to most. The 23-year-old is heading to the Syrian front line. It gives me great satisfaction being able to defend my country against terrorists who want to destroy it. It's strange to find women here in the line of fire, even more so because Miriam is a mother. Her sons are just four and six years old. I signed up because We've covered on Israeli News Live, we have covered more instances like this here where you have uh, women that are fighting, and, and, if you, and I'll include some of the links of that as well, because in some cases the women that are fighting in this war are fighting because, of they, as they've stated in other news broadcasts that we have put out, that 
they're there to support President Bashar al-Assad. They are there because they watched their families, children, and everything killed by the U.S.-backed rebels, al-Nursa, al-Qaeda, the different groups, ISIS, that are in the region there. You know, had the United States, had the Obama administration, when Russia came in, had they worked with Russia to get rid of ISIS and stop funding the terrorists, the war would be over. But instead, they've done it the other way around. And now Russia is sending in more warships to the region as well. Many are believing that Gog is coming to take out Israel. That's not the case. That's not the case. Even the young man, Nathan, who saw had the near-death experience, clearly identified Obama as Gog, and he said it'll be Obama that will start the war in the Middle East. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live, sharing with you the facts that you didn't know. Shalom.